morning. This is Pastor Kamard from the Independent Bible Church in Duryea. Uh, we want to welcome you to our morning service. Thank you for watching us on Facebook. And today there's problems with Zoom. Uh, and uh, everybody around the world is having those difficulties. And so we hope that if you're uh, in one of those and you're joining us uh, on Facebook today, we want to welcome you uh, in that. Also, I want to let you know. That one now we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to uh, ask uh, Shane to come. I'm sorry. And he is going to lead us in song. And then we're going to have a word of prayer. Okay, we're going to sing My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. If you have your Majesty hymn book at home and would like to use it, that's 416. My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. We'll sing the first and last stanza. has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, today of uh, the multitudes around the world that are trying to uh, worship. In some places they have gathered, and we praise God for that. In some places they're in the same situation we're in, and depending upon the uh, internet and a program called Zoom, or some have gone to Google, and others, Father, are just watching on Facebook, or they have some other means, like Vimeo, or uh, whatever other program is out there giving them the opportunity to uh, send a live broadcast. But we're looking to you today that in the multitudes that are listening to the Word of God that you will do a great work. Father, this world needs an awakening to come back to you. We are praying that you will help us to be able to look to the Scriptures today and see that there is a path that you give us something that does generate a reviving within the heart of a man. I pray today that thou would minister to our hearts today in that way as believers, that we might rejoice in thee, we might trust you, we might repent of our sin, we might humble ourselves and walk in your ways. Well, thank you for that aid. I pray that you will help the multitudes that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that you'll help those that may be watching a, 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 a service like this on video, uh, online, somehow. That you will get through to them, that you will help them to see their need, and that they might ultimately turn to you and trust you as their Savior. We're praying, my God, today that you will have your way, that Christ would be lifted up, and in spite of uh, the difficulties that are within our world, that the gospel might shine clearly unto men, and we'll praise you for that help. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless. Shane's going to come back. All right, now just before the message, we're going to sing a Shelter in a Time of Storm in the Majesty Hymn Book. That's number 99. A Shelter in a Time of Storm. Sing the first and last stanzas. Oh 
Well, if you take your Bibles this morning, if you turn with me to Isaiah, you find Isaiah chapter number 66. Isaiah number 66, chapter number 66. And I would like to read verses 1 through 3, if you will, please. Isaiah 66, 1, 2, 3. 1 to 4, I'm sorry. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that which I delighted not. Between the actual historical times when revival takes place, there's much talk about revival. Have you heard a lot of people talk about the reviving of the church? There's been a lot of preaching on the subject as well. I have heard many messages on the subject of, of, of revival, and I have preached my share of those uh, particular kind of messages. We have even scheduled meetings with evangelists or other preachers, and we call those meetings revival meetings. Interesting, isn't it? We get excited for a week or two, but in the final analysis, no revival has ever come. We promote prayer, soul winning, we urge faithfulness and evangelism, etc., etc., but we have not witnessed the sweeping, purifying, outpouring of God's blessed Spirit in our midst. We have to ask a question what's our problem? Perhaps the text before us will offer some answers uh, to the question as we consider, number one, who God is. Number two, what God thinks of formalism. And number three, what attracts God's attention. Let's pray one more time, shall we? Our Father, we're praying that you will minister to our hearts as we break apart these four verses in Isaiah chapter 66. We trust that you will give us your grace that you will help us, my Heavenly Father, to uh, respond to your Spirit's promptings from the Word of God. And for that, Lord, we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Who is God? Who is He? Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, I think, answers partially that question that is before us. Who is God? Well, thus saith the Lord. The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Verse number two, for all those things hath mine hand made. First of all, God is the creator. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Think about this. Men have advanced so far. They have made so many technological innovation and innovative discoveries, I should say, that the creator is far from man's thoughts. Have you seen the wonderful things that God, that, uh, God has allowed us to make? Uh, if we could transport our, ourselves back to, into the book of Genesis, the Tower of Babel would have been the latest, greatest technological uh, thing that man had accomplished. And he was... Uh, of course, we find in the scripture they were trying to arise to be like God. Well, we understand that they got so far, and then God said, this is not going to be anymore. 
And of course, he destroyed that tower of Babel and the city of Babylon and scattered them all throughout the world. That scattering has not stopped man from being innovative. And he should be. He should be discovering things. He should be looking for things to uh, accomplish and make advancements. But to advance to the point where the Creator is far from our thoughts is not within God's will. Even in the throes of this pandemic, we see that man is attempting independence from the Creator. When the public service ads running for large pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals in other words, or the sciences that TV is promoting and magazines are promoting, uh, you know, science will show us the way. Science will get us out of this. Well, is science our modern day Tower of Babel? I'm just questioning. Is it the place where we throw all of our confidence that science is going to be the way out of this thing? Here is uh, Forbes magazine, April 7th, 2020. An article written by Ethan Siegel titled, The Three Ways Science Will Get Us Through the COVID-19 Pandemic. Really. It says, and I quote, I'm not reading the whole article, I'm just reading a couple of phrases out of it. I quote, we no longer live in an era where we have to rely on assumptions or superstitions to understand what is occurring, end of quote. Is, could it be that he's referring to those of us who believe in our creator, that we're superstitious? I'm not superstitious at all. I'll walk under any ladder anywhere, as long as there's not some nut up on top of it that's gonna dump a paint can on my head. I will cross a street not only where a black cat has gone, but I'll cross the street with him. I'm not superstitious. But I do believe in my creator. And I don't believe that without the creator's help, the scientists can move anything with this COVID-19. They need us to be praying for them. And whether they want my prayer or not, they're going to get it. They list these three things. Number one, they call it the modern frontiers. The quick response that science had to the initial outbreak, they said, is this. Within just weeks of the first reported case, scientists had not only identified the microscopic virus responsible for the disease, but had sequenced its entire genome or its genes, end of quote. I'm happy they're able to do that so quickly, aren't you? That's a wonderful thing. But to say that God was not helping them to do that is out of bounds. When they take the entire credit for it, they're out of bounds. Number two, they say the next thing that is helping us and helping them is the curiosity-driven foundations. I quote again from the article. With respect to COVID-19, we are already seeing the payoff of a wide swath of curiosity-driven research, end of quote. Um, didn't Louis Pasteur do that? Didn't every doctor in every plague seek for a cure? And doesn't it seem interesting that one of the things that God says he uses in this world to reorder the population is pestilence. And without God, it won't stop. With God, there has been a continual restructuring of the bacteria and the viruses and the means by which it transfers to mankind. Read it in history. There has always been curiosity. And there should be. But without God, we'll not find an answer. Number three, they say, is the edge uh, of the fundamental. And I quote, this is the most powerful knowledge in all of science, the fundamental limits of what's physically possible, end of quote. And what they're basically saying by that is that 
who knows the possibilities of mankind anymore. Those possibilities stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch uh, on into infinity. You know, because there's a creator who is infinite, possibilities are infinite as well. This is no new news. I'm glad for all the advancements in science. I'm happy for what they're able to do and how they are dealing with these particular problems. I'm glad that they're working on a vaccine and, and the president has fast-tracked that so perhaps by January we have something that we can put in our arm uh, and prevent it just like smallpox and all the other things and the flu shot and so on. But there is necessarily this understanding that is missing, and that is that God is in charge of all things. They're leaving the Creator out. I'm not placing my soul in, the, in their hands, but in the hands of the Almighty God. Now, you can call it superstition if you want to. Call it whatever you want to. But my confidence is in the Lord. Not in any place else. My confidence is in God. And while I'm glad for those advancements, my confidence is in my God. Yours should be too. Well, it boils down to this. You have a problem. Man can create something to help you. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I know some people that I have visited either in a hospital or a nursing home or in their home where man has been trying to create a solution for their problem for generations, and none has been found. Interesting. Today, for example, we have artificial blood, we have artificial hearts. Uh, Lord, I think half of the stuff we put in our mouth to satisfy our hunger is artificial food. We have artificial rubber. Are you driving on a car that has synthetic rubber, synthetic nylon or whatever kind of material it is, you're not driving on rubber and you know it because of the way your car rides. And of course, by the way, it wears out. Hey guys, have you ever filled a hole with artificial wood in, in your woodworking? We got artificial everything here and there and everywhere. Who knows what's next? Men are manipulating the genes, the cells. They're trying to manipulate the chromosomes and even experimenting with creating life, sometimes through cloning. It's an interesting thing that's going on. But here's the question. In all of this, and I'm thankful for every scientific discovery, so don't misunderstand me. But could it be that man is serving the creature more than the creator? Have the advancements, but don't leave out God. Ask him for his direction, but don't leave out God. He is the creator. This is what it boils down to. I want you to think about this. Men in the past did not have enough to technology to rely upon, and they had to rely upon their creator to get through life. I want you to consider a couple of things. Joshua chapter number 10 and verses six through 13 says this. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up to us quickly and save us and help us. All the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So they, they had a problem, didn't they? So Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand, and there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. 
And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a the great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and to Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down a great stone from heaven upon them and to Azekah and they died, and they were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still. And the moon stayed, and the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hast not to go down, and hasted, I'm sorry, not to go down about a whole day. Hmm. How dare Joshua make such a prayer? How dare he? Why didn't he send for more military? Why didn't he ask somebody to fast track some new weapon? Why didn't he appeal to the scientists? Because in the day in which he was living, he had the most advanced technological weaponry that was there. He couldn't go any further. But he couldn't control physics. Only God can. He could not control the sun and the moon. And I know that there's varying uh, uh, explanations of what that is. I'm just going to take God's word for it. How dare he pray such a prayer? Sun, don't go down. Moon, don't come up. Wow. Now, if that were the isolated and only instance of men depending upon God in the scripture we might have somewhat to question. But it's not the only instance of something happening like that. King Hezekiah had judgment from the Lord upon him for showing the treasury to the enemies of Israel. Do you remember? They came, he's boasting, he's throwing his chest out, he's saying, look at how rich and how grand I am. And God was displeased with that. He pled for his healing because God struck him with an illness. And he pleads for his healing and then asks for a confirming sign. 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 9 to 11. And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, now, now listen to this. this, this is incredible. I want you to think this through. Can a shadow go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? Is that a common thing? Well, Hezekiah said that's a light thing. But let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So, so it can go forward 10 degrees, easy. Let it go backwards 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord. And he brought the shadow ten degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Would we ask such a thing today? For the sun to come back ten degrees? This is incredible. It would cause some individuals to consider that the Bible is nothing more than a folklore book. But you know what? Who can stop the creator from doing anything he wants with his creation? If he could hang the stars. If he could give this world life in the six days. Why can't he just take the sun and move it back ten degrees? Now, don't argue with me all the science that would be involved in that. 
All I know is that God can do anything he wants to do. Man must have an overwhelming conviction that the Almighty, that God is the creator and ruler of all that there is. And so in Isaiah 66, 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Heaven is his throne. A throne is a place of rule, of authority, a place where an individual ushers out uh, words that demand obedience. And the same token when he says, it is my footstool, footstool is a word which indicates rulership, a place where God is pleased to dwell and to rule. And so in Isaiah 54, 5, For thy maker is thine husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. He's our God. He will not be diminished, even though man tries to diminish him. He wins in the end. Even the church, however, needs to know that it is God who created and rules. Paul writes this, Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, what do you consider to be all things? What is it? I think all things means all things. Everything that he has created. The heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars... Me, you, the forest, the animals, the earth, all the planets, all the galaxies, the universe. And if there are more than one universe, and there is, all those universes. God is the creator of all of those things. And he is ruling in all those things. And by him, all those things consist or they are held together. To Timothy, Paul, under inspiration, wrote in 1 Timothy 6.15, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. Now, isn't that an interesting word, potentate? It means ruler, officer, or great authority. The king of kings. Capital K, first king. Small k, second king. And Lord, capital L, of Lord's small L. He is absolutely over all. Who is God? He's the creator. He is the ruler of all that there is. Without him, there was not anything made that was made, it says of Jesus Christ. So we have to come to the acknowledgement that God is over all. Once we really understand that and really bow our head and our heart and our knees to that, then we can begin to proceed to the next point. What God thinks of formalism. Look at verse number three of Isaiah 66. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. You say, but wait a minute, wasn't Israel all about sacrificing? Yeah. All of those sacrifices pointed toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice at Calvary. But I want to let you know that dead formalism came into Israel a long time ago. Notice how God is describing this? As if you cut, killed a man, as if you cut off a dog's neck, if, if your uh, oblation is as, as if it is, uh, you know, what does he say here? Uh, swine's blood? All those things are listed as abominations before God. So a man is going through the rituals. He's doing everything that he thinks he possibly can do. 
but there's no link to God. What's formalism? Formalism is religious in its, and in its religious connotation. It's an emphasis on the ritual and observance of religion rather than its meaning. Now we can turn to a lot of places. Let me give you one illustration here. This illustration begins, and I quote this way. A gentleman once entered a hall with his son. They saw a number of well-dressed people. Some of them standing together in groups, others apart, some sitting in various postures. The son's attention was fixed by a pleasant-looking gentleman, somewhat gaudily dressed. He said, Father, who is that gentleman? He seems a mild, pleasant-looking person, but what a singular dress he wears. Who is he? Ask the gentleman who stands near you, said the father. If you please, sir, can you inform me who that gentleman opposite is? No, answer came from that person. The boy think it's, thinks it's strange. At last his father tells him, my son, those are only wax figures. There is no life in them. They're all outside. Very fair to look at, but there is no soul and no life. They're outside and nothing else. And so it is with those who have no internal religion at all, only external. Formalism, what is it? It's religion with no reason, it's just emotion. Know anybody that fits that category? They're all emotion, they're all for raising their hands, they're all for swaying back and forth, they're all for the grand music and so on. And if they're not touched in their emotions when they come together to church, they have nothing else. Religion with no reason. They don't have any scripture. Secondly, it's ceremony without conscience. There's no conviction. When I, I don't know about you, but when I come to church, when I listen to a sermon, I want that sermon to pierce my innermost being and my inner man. I want it to peel back the onion skin of my sin. And I want to be exposed so that I can be right with my Heavenly Father. I want to learn something about my God, about my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are some today that don't want to go to church and have conviction. They don't want to open a Bible. It's sacrifice without sanctification. There's no cleansing. There's no altar call. There's no altar call to the heart. There's nothing that goes on by way of getting things right with God. There's no confession of sin. I don't mean going into a little booth and having some guy on the other side of a screen tell you to go do so many prayers on a, on a, bead, on a beaded chain. Formalism is church without Christ. Formalism is worship with no object. Formalism. Who has it? Well, some of us would be quick to point the finger and say, it's, it's those modernistic churches out there. They have nothing by way of anything that is real. And you would be right. They don't. They fit this pattern. There are churches out there that have a lot of what we would call pomp and circumstance. Pomp and ceremony, is that a better term to use? And they would have their parades and then they would have their ornate dress. They would have their wonderful music, whether it's from a grand pipe organ that costs $100,000 and a magnificent musician that also gets $50,000 for playing it in church. Whether it's the parade that is within or without church, or whether it's the solemnness when you walk into the building and you've got to fold your little patties and walk down with your head bowed down the aisle and you need to bow your knee there because this is a holy place that you're in. And then when they walk out, they walk out like any other Joe looking for their beer and cigarette. Nothing has changed on the inside. 
As a matter of fact, if you belong to one of those churches, you might be able to go outside and have that beer and cigarette with your pastor or priest. It also, however, can talk about any Bible believer who only goes through the motions having the right language, the right mannerisms, the right haircut, the right clothes, but no heart for God. What do they do when they come to a church where Christ is at and the word of God is preached? Can a person who sits in that kind of an environment be formalistic as well? Sure. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you sung a hymn and you actually paid attention to the meaning of the words? When was the last time? Or you just open the book and sing the songs and there's nothing that reaches the heart. When was the last time that you opened your Bible in a, in a church service or even at home during your devotions and you listened to the message or you read the passage of Scripture but you didn't pay attention to anything but you could check a box that you've been to church or you did your devotions? And somebody was going to ask you, do I really communicate with God when I do these things? What would your answer be? What does God hate? Does he hate this? Yea, he says, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delighteth. Look at what he calls this in Isaiah 66, 3, the middle part of the verse. Look at what he calls it. Abomination. So men meet with men but not God. Men excite men, but there are, they are not excited by the things of God. I would venture to say, let me ask you this. We have a lot of churches that have a big hullabaloo all the time. Okay. And there is this wonderful uh, gathering of people, some hundreds, some thousands, and there is a rock concert that is going on behind, uh, on the platform, in front of them. Maybe there's a play that takes place. And they may applaud and they may say amen. They may do all kind of things. They may jump up from their seat while the music is playing and sway back and forth and so on and so forth. And they may have a grand time for one service a week. But I want to challenge any pastor that is out there to call for a daily prayer meeting at 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. See who you get. I'll put myself to that same challenge. Who would we get? Are we dead in formalism? Do we just meet with men and we're excited about the things that we can produce by way of what we say is worship? Or are we really excited about the things of God? Therefore, we continue to do our will and not the will of our Heavenly Father. Thirdly, it seems to me that in every revival, someone got a hold of God's attention. You say, well, I thought God is aware of things all the time. Yes, he's aware of all, everything that is going on. This is what's so difficult for us. He knows exactly where we're at. And every now and then in the history of mankind, in the history of our Savior, we find out that God has paid particular attention to a certain group of individuals who have done some things that have attracted God's attention. It's not that he was unaware of what everybody else was doing. It's just that he was on the outside of that group, not on the inside of that group. And then there were other groups of individuals down through the history of the church that have gotten a hold of God and God said, I can work with that individual. I can work with that group. I can work with that people. And we call that revival. What attracts men's attention? Look at verse number two. And right in the middle of the verse again. But to this man will I look. Isn't that a fabulous passage? 
wonderful phrase. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Let's unpack it. I sincerely believe that men do not feel spiritually bankrupt today. I think they just feel self-sufficient and capable of handling their lives and their soul's condition without God. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor, the bankrupt in spirit. Consider Luke 18, 9 to 4, 14. And he spake this parable, that would be Jesus, unto certain which trusted in themselves. There's the criteria. There's that which defines who he is speaking about. That they were righteous and despised others. You can't be righteous and despise others. But they thought they were righteous and yet despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed this within himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Ah, which one of the two got God's attention? Wasn't, the, wasn't it not the man that was bankrupt in spirit? As a believer, saved, washed by the blood, do you feel spiritually bankrupt and in need of God the Creator? Do you feel that you're absolutely nothing or that you're somebody? And God ought to pay attention to you because you're someone. Or do you feel that I'm just absolutely nobody? And I'm wondering why God can even think about me. Bankrupt. Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. God sees you exactly the way you are. But if you do see yourself as bankrupt, Psalm 34.6 says this, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. He got the attention of God. What other kind of man gets God's attention? Well, it's a poor man, and it's also a man who is of a contrite spirit. The word contrite itself means crippled. We try to eliminate that word out of our vocabulary today in this politically correct, charged society that we live in. But it's a good Bible word, crippled. I am contrite, I am crippled, I am lame, or I am maimed. And most of the time it refers to somebody that's been involved in an accident and the result of that accident. Here, it's used metaphorically to speak of a smitten spirit, a humble spirit, a crippled spirit. Therefore, it speaks to us of a man who sees himself as God sees him. How does God see me? Poor, bankrupt, crippled. That man becomes humbled who sees himself as God sees him. He becomes broken, he becomes wounded, and he grieves over his sin. In Psalm 34, verses one, and verse 18, it says, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a, 
and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, a man with spirit is good. But a man without a broken spirit is, a, is an abomination to God. God wants to preserve your spirit, not your rebellion, your spirit. But that spirit must be broken over the will of God. Thirdly, the kind of man attracts God's attention is a man who trembles at the word of God. Isaiah 66, the last part of the verse. And trembleth at my word. Why don't men fear God's word anymore? Well, where does a man get wisdom from? By studying books, by getting a degree from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, wherever, Stanford University, Penn State University, oh, Lord knows I went there. You don't get wisdom because you have a degree or you have a piece of paper that says you graduated. You get wisdom because you fear God. And men don't fear God, and therefore they will not fear his word. Fear the word of God, because you, because you don't fear God. Let me illustrate this just for a second. Many years ago, our church was configured just a little bit differently. We were having a problem because we had a very long step um, porch area, if you will, as you came up to go through the main entrance of the church building, it was right in the middle of the church building. If the church building was elongated this way, the church entrance was right in the middle. We had a problem because some young people who were riding their skateboards were soaping our steps, and they were causing it to be very slippery because, you know, they like to jump on things, and so they were jumping on our ste steps, and they had a nice long uh, I think about a 12 or 15 foot run that they could actually slide down the steps and do their antics and gymnastics and so on, so on and so forth. My wife and I pulled into the parking lot one day. Now I didn't yell at them. I just got out of the car and I said, hey young people, come here just a second, I want to talk to you. And as they came over to me, I said, you know, you're, you're creating a hazard here for our elderly people that are going into church when you're putting this soap to make it, uh, our steps slippery to slide on, I'm gonna ask you not to do that anymore. Uh, and if you could, peel that off of there because you guys are the ones that put it on there. At first the reaction was, oh, okay, sure, we, I'm, we're sorry, we'll do that. And as they walked about 10 feet away, they turned around to me and said, and who are you anyway? Why should we obey you? I said, I'm the pastor of the church. In essence, I'm the key holder. I could call the authorities and ask them to physically remove you. I didn't yell at you. I asked you nicely to stop this. But if you want to get ugly, we can get ugly about it. But they didn't fear me. And therefore, they didn't fear my words. You understand? We don't fear God. We don't fear what he has said. Do believers fear the word of God? Well, let me ask you this. Would you obey a God whom you fear? I feared my dad in a lot of ways. I did not want to disobey him. That's my physical father. My heavenly father is more important. Hebrews 2 and 1 and 2 says this. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word of God spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. I'm going to stop there. I can go on and preach a little bit further from that passage of scripture. But I want to let you know that we should be fearful of what God has said in his word. Hebrews 10.31 It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Do you fear him? I guarantee you this. If you're listening by way of Facebook or some other means out there today. Or if one of our individuals from church is 
created a little watch party and you might be in another part of the world and you're listening to this and you know that the word of God says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'll guarantee you, if you fear God, you will bow your knee now and trust Christ as your savior. But if you don't fear God, then you don't fear his word. And you don't fear the fact that there is a hell that awaits you because you're trying to make light of it. Christian, if you don't fear God and you don't fear God's word, then you are in a position wherein you're not going to be obedient to the things that God says. And so you're going to walk in your own ways, and hence, you won't have God's attention when you pray. I think you will agree with me that the church is in need of desperate revival. We will never have it unless judgment begins in the house of God. We will never have it until we begin to get God's attention by being the kind of Christian that is bankrupt, contrite in spirit, and fears God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you that you've given us this time to be together that you've given us this morning to open the scriptures and look into the word of God. I praise you, my heavenly father, that you will help us as we make decisions. Decisions, father, about our own bankrupt condition. Decisions, my heavenly father, about having this broken spirit within us, this crippled spirit in need of God and everything. This position, my heavenly father, of being fearful of your word. We acknowledge you as the creator of all. We know that you're in control of all, absolutely all things. We know that you hate formalism. We pray that we would not be such. And my heavenly father, that you would grant to each of us individually revival. For that we'll praise you. With your heads bowed out there and your eyes closed. Maybe there's somebody listening in today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their savior. If that's you, I want to invite you to come to the cross. I want you to invite you to come to know Christ, Christ alone. I can't save you, our church can't save you, but the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary to die for your sin, that if you'll acknowledge your sin, if you'll ask him to for, for forgiveness of that sin, and ask him to save you, to deliver you, the Bible gives us this assurance, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll say something simply like this, in pure faith, trusting Christ alone, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. The promise of God is that he will save any who do that. Christian, you might be out there and you may have assessed yourself as not relying upon the creator at all. Maybe relying upon your own ingenuity, your own strength, Maybe you see that you've seen that you're in dead formalism, even though you may go to a church wherever you go to church. And it's alive with Christ, it's alive with the gospel, it's alive with the word of God. But you can't even sing the hymns of the faith without being steeped in formalism because you don't even know what those hymns say. Maybe you're an individual out there and you've assessed your heart and you think you're rich, but you are poor and blind and naked before God. You've assessed your heart and spirit and you see that you have, you have a haughty spirit instead of a contrite spirit. And maybe you see today that you're not really fearful of God's word. Would you repent of those things? Dear Christian, will you take a step toward revival? And we'll praise God for that. Let's close. Father, thank you for these that are making a decision today. We pray that you will seal that decision in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Lord bless you for tuning in. We trust that maybe some things on Zoom will get fixed by tonight, but if, if not, join us on Facebook this evening at 6 p.m.